Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts of the cravings of his heart. His blessings are greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always preposterous. In the haunting, in your laws are far from him. He sneers at all his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will shake me. I am always to be happy and never have trouble. His mouth is full of curses and lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue, and he lies with uh, weight near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent, watching in secret for his victims. He lies in wait like a lion in cover. He lies in want to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed. They collapse, they fall under his strength, and he says to him, God has for, forgotten, for he covers his face and never sees. Alas, Lord, lift up your hand, O God, do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he cannot call me to account? But you, O God, do see trouble and grief. You consider it to take it in hand. The victim commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Call him to account for his wickedness that would not be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. You, you hear, O Lord, and the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen for their cry. Defending the fatherless and the oppressed in order that man who is the earth may terrify no more. Father, I pray now that we might just focus in upon your word and what you have for us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many times in your Christian life have you asked, God, where are you? Anybody? Okay, now, how many of you are lying? Raise your hand. <laughs> I think if you look back in your life, and we're gonna talk about some of these things, I think if you look back in your life, you're going to find that you said something similar to this, if not those very words. That question comes up most often when our circumstances cause us stress, cause us to be angry, hopelessness, and even fear. And where is God when your family member breaks his arm right before a million dollar golf tournament? Where is he? Where's God when your son loses control of his car and, and is killed? It reminds me of when I was in high school, that was 25 years ago, and uh, <laughs> let's pray. <laughs> yeah. When I was in high school, <laughs> My dad and I were in the uh, funeral business, and back then, most funeral homes had the ambulance service as well. And uh, there was a, I'm trying to make this sound good. Um, there was a tavern out in the country, about 15 miles from where I lived. And on Friday and Saturday night, high school kids, 16 and over, could go to that, that uh, tavern and we could drink. And it was an unusual place to go. So we were there that night and a friend of mine, his name was James Rich, 
Never forget him. He was kind of a thin kid and uh, he had a girlfriend and they had a fight and he got in his car and he took off. Spinning his wheels and taking off. And that guy was going so fast down the country road that he missed a curve. He went off into the cornfield and he ran into a tree and it killed him. The thing, uh, my dad and I were taking the ambulance out there and when I got there I was thinking, there's only one tree in this area and he had to hit it. One tree, folks, and that kid was dead. Mm. So sometimes we say, hey God, where are you? What are you doing? Why is this happening? That's what we think sometimes. You're just told that you have terminal cancer and you only have a few weeks to live. God, where are you? Where's God when the stock market crashes and now your retirement account is zero and you have nothing to live on if you retire? You're told that you have MS. God, where are you? As it strikes one of your one of your family members or your spouse. God, where are you when your house burns down and there are a lot of valuable things inside but you couldn't get to them? God, what? Where are you? That's right. Where are you? You lose your house and the questions that people ask when bad things happen to them, it always comes down to that. God, where are you? Psalm chapter 10 that we just read is called a lament chapter. Lament means to yell a complaint. And that's what David is doing here in chapter 10. He is, he is beside himself. He is upset, but he's upset with God. God, come on now, where are you? He was going through all kinds of trouble. One of the reasons I enjoy reading the Bible, this book, folks, is real. It's filled with real people. It's filled with real emotions. It's not a scapegoat on anything that's in there. David, which is the writer of most of the chapters of the book of Psalms, tells it like it is. As a matter of fact, when he wrote about himself, he wrote about the affair that he had with Bathsheba. Now, before we take a closer look at chapter 10, I think we need to understand something. You are not always expected to be happy. That's what it tells us here at the end of verse, verse 6. He said, I, I'm always happy. you got to be kidding me. That's not the way it works. As a matter of fact, some Christians feel that if you're sad, you're in sin. You're in sin, and they don't like that. As you read the Bible, you're going to find that there are godly people who are broken. Godly people who are grieving. Godly people who are crying. Godly people who are troubled at every turn in their lives. Do you know what they do? They let God know about it. That's what chapter 10 is about. David is upset with God. And I have an idea that there are times in most of us here when we are upset with God because of either what is happening that we don't like or what is not happening that we wish would. So where's God? I think we need to understand that happiness is something we strive for, but we seldom have. And we seldom have it for very long if we get it because of the way the world is today. Do you see the box of tissues that's underneath your chair or perhaps in the row in front of you? They're not there just to blow your nose. 
They're there to wipe the tears off when God speaks to your heart and brings you under conviction. There must be times when you're brought under that conviction by the Holy Spirit. Brokenness, a deep sorrow before the Lord. And the important thing is that we need to learn to be honest with God when he deals with our hearts, with our minds, and the way we are living our lives. I recently heard about a worship service in a small African village. Before the service began, the house next to the church just burnt to the ground. The man who lived there was a suspected thief, so people really didn't like him and they didn't care what happened to his house. A week before that, a tornado came through that county and ripped through 53 homes. Five people were killed. Then that night, a gang hunted down a 14-year-old boy walking home from church and they stabbed him to death. That's a true story. God, where are you? The pastor of the church then began to pray. Lord, you're the creator and you are the sovereign. But why did that man's house burn down? Why did the wind tear all the roofs off of our houses? Why did a gang of cowards cut short the life of one of our own kids when he had everything to live for? Over and over again, Lord, we find ourselves having to deal with death. Then as he prayed, the congregation responded with sighing and with groaning. Then once he finished his prayer very slowly, the whole congregation began to sing. At first very quiet, and then as they sang the next three verses or so, they increased their volume as they sang that song. They sang and they sang and they sang song after song, but it was a, always a song of praise. You see, we can praise God during the difficult times we have, folks. You don't have to lament over them. You don't have to cry over them. You can go to God and give him praise. Lord, I don't know why this is happening to me. But it is. And God helped me through it. I remember when I was diagnosed with cancer and um, uh, of the prostate. And uh, the church was just beginning to grow. It started with 19 people. And now it was beginning to grow. It was a year or two later. And sure enough, I came down with cancer. I have James working with me, and he goes ahead and preaches when I can't. And there are a couple of others of you who are pastors of churches, and you've retired. And uh, hey, listen. I thank the Lord for you people that you can step in and be a part of the ministry of this church. But here we are all these years later and everything seems to be going just fine. So these people sang and sang and they sang those praises. Praise to God who in Jesus had plunged him into the worst that it could be. And give them a promise. A promise that at the end of life here on earth, there's going to be a continuation in heaven for those who will trust in Christ as their Savior. He gives us that promise. You see, our hope is not about everything being perfect in this life. You see, we have have things that end up being in the way of that perfection. It's about a promise of life to come and a future that is offered to each one of us in Christ. This morning I want you to see what the psalmist says to do when you don't seem to be able to find God. We've all been there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would speak to our hearts and open up our minds. Help us to understand and we'll thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name.
Amen. The first thing I want you to remember is this. Sometimes God seems unavailable and distant. There are times when he seems to be unavailable and distant. That doesn't mean he's not working. That doesn't mean he isn't listening to what you have to say as you go and pray. It means that he is working behind the scenes to work in your life. And I'm thankful to the Lord that he's wanting to do that. I believe that there have been times when we have prayed to God and it just feels like that prayer has hit the ceiling point and it comes crashing right back down at us. It doesn't get any further than that. Then there are times when God seems to be too busy to bother with us. That's what we think. It doesn't seem to matter how loud we yell or how many tears we shed or how much pain we experience in our lives. We feel that God is standing way, way off somewhere, but not where you can get to him. And he's hiding. He's hiding from you and your time of trouble has come. God, where are you? We think that too often in our lives. David felt this way and it wasn't his first time that he felt this way. There were other times when he felt as well and he wrote it in God's word in the book of Psalms. There are more psalms of lament that he wrote than any other type of psalm. Here's another verse just a few chapters later that sounds very familiar to some of you. Psalms chapter 13, verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? David was going through some extremely difficult times in his life. And he's praying to God, he's basically saying, God, where are you? Now, I think we need to be honest with ourselves this morning. Church people don't have it all figured out. We don't. Well, I think the majority of preachers on the television have come to the conclusion that these are the last days that we're living in. I'm not so sure of that even myself. I'm not going to tell you that these are the last days because I think there are other things that have to take place before that can happen. I think it can be a lot worse than what we are experiencing today. And then the Lord is going to return. I think the church is kind of like a showroom, not like a body shop. In a showroom, everything is perfect. Spotless cars are put on display. They're all shiny as the lights glare off of them. No problems. Everything is at the best it can possibly be out there in that showroom. Cars are in the body shop. That's what they're for. But they're in there for another reason. It's because they're banged up and they need some straightening out. That's what the church is for. Our bodies, because of sin, are dented and scratched up and have difficulty taking them down the road. How about you? I think sometimes we need to get straightened out ourselves. You know what the scripture says? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins. He's going to forgive you your sin if you confess it as a born again Christian. And he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You see, that's the Christian side of salvation. Before you get saved, you need to go to the Lord and ask him to forgive you of your sin. 
That's confession, yes. But it's confession of every sin, every sin you have you have committed from that point of trusting Christ your Savior on back. You say, well, there's some awful bad things there to make any difference. The blood of Christ is able to cover that, purchase that, forgive you of that, and give you the gift of eternal life. You see, in church, you can come and get your body fixed from the sin that's there. All of us have a need to be healed from time to time. All of us struggle in this life that God has given us. And there's no sense in pretending that things have not happened that we know that God is not pleased with. So we might as well admit that there are some moments that God seems to be unreachable. And when you give him a call and he hits the red button instead of the green button, you're not going to get any answer from him. Let me encourage you. You aren't alone in this. Because that's what David is going through and he explains his feelings in verse 2 through verse 13. And he tells God like it is. Now let me clarify that. Even as he is telling God the way it is, he was respectful to God and careful of the attitude and the use of the words as he went to the Lord in prayer. You and I can yell to God. That's not wrong. God, where are you? What's wrong with that question? Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Because that's the way we feel. But God is still there. He is still there. So we might as well admit that there are moments when God seems to be unreachable. And when you give him a call and he hits that red button, boy, you're, you're out of luck. So let me encourage you. You're not alone. You're not alone. Do you see that? Do you hear that twice? Then it seems that the wrong people are winning and God's people are losing. Amen? We struggle. We try to live a good Christian life. We try to do what God wants us to do and the way he wants us to do it. He wants us to live the Christian life. And boy, we struggle with that. And yet God is there. Even though we don't feel it, he is there. Look at how the wicked get ahead and the Christians suffer. Look at how the psalmist describes the wicked. In verses 2 through 4, and I'm going to read these again. In his arrogance, a wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in schemes he devises. And we find here he boasts and cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Arrogance. A wicked individual who has rejected the God that saves you and me and died for you at Calvary's cross. These people are boldly saying, hey, there is no God. That's why you think you're, you're uh, wasting time praying because nothing ever happens. Then in verses 5 through 7, it speaks about the wicked who refuse. They refuse to change. And then they use the word lion in here. Like a lion, these kinds of people represent those who are wicked. The wicked are like a lion who lies in wait to pounce on the poor and the people that are having struggles in their lives. They claim to believe the law, but they don't go very far. The wicked person refuses to change and he says, I will not be moved. 
I'm not going to be moved because there is no God. Then verses 8 through 11, the wicked will resist authority. And again, like the lion, they claim to believe the law won't catch them and the Lord doesn't see them. They say, God has forgotten me. You ever feel that way? Then verses 12 through 13, the wicked remain arrogant. For several years, surveys revealed that 33% of Americans attend church regularly. 33% of our population. I think since we've had the COVID and on that, all that, it has uh, changed quite a bit. I don't think it's 33% anymore. I've seen some say 25% uh, of, the, of the Americans that used to go to church no longer go. And that's true. They stay home because they found that the uh, lazy boy is much more comfortable than chairs. And they don't have to sit there and listen to the preacher for five hours. We got a long way to go, folks. Did you bring your lunch? 17% attend church once a month of our population. That means that 83% no longer attend any kind of a church. Our world is changing, folks. And it's changing fast, isn't it? Barner Research says the latest generation were resisting God while sitting in church. Now listen to this. Today, more people are resisting God without ever showing up at church. There are people out there that don't like the Christian. If you're living the Christian life and people can see it, they aren't necessarily liking you because you bring guilt to their lives and the way they're living it. Now verses 14 through 18. Sometimes things are not what they seem. Just because you feel a certain way about something, does that mean that it's true? No. There are times when God puts us in the dark so we can recognize the light. As you read these verses, it's apparent that David changes his tune. And we see that here. He came to his senses. His griping and his complaining turned to praise to God. He changed. That's what God can do in your life. I don't know how you came here this morning with what kind of attitude or how you feel about things, but God can always make it better. God can always change your heart and your life. Lost people are going to act and talk like lost people. That's what they do. It upsets me when church people say that they know Jesus and act like a lost person who doesn't know Christ at all. What lost people need isn't a set of rules to abide by. They're, they don't need that. But what they do need is the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. In verses 14 and 15 here in chapter 10, God is never too busy to listen to you or be too far away to even hear you. He isn't. He's right there, folks. He's right here with us right now. Verse 14, I want you to take a look at it if you would. But you, O oh God, do see the trouble and grief. You consider it to take it in hand. The victim commits himself to you. You are the helper, the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Call him to account for his wickedness. That would not be found out. Wow. God is never too busy, folks. He's never too busy to listen to you when you go to prayer. I honestly believe it's kind of like you. You haven't seen your children for, let's say, three weeks, a month or something like that. They stop by. 
you're so glad to see him. You're so glad to see him. God is that way as well. God likes you to come to him and pray. It's a conversation, not one way, but both ways, from you to him and then him down to you. He, he will pray, he, excuse me, he will talk to you as you pray. That's what prayer is, it's conversation. And God, I believe, has a big smile on his face. And, and when I pray, I said, God, I know that your ear is bending toward me. He's there to listen. He's there to listen. Things aren't always the way they seem. When you can't seem to find God, it doesn't mean that he's playing hide and seek somewhere. When you watch the news and someone is killed by a shooter and the police are looking for him or by a drunk driver who hits and kills a pedestrian and then drives away, we want justice. We want this to be taken care of. It feels too often like justice is delayed, but justice will come. Are you trusting Jesus and his finished work upon the cross at Calvary? His shed blood will redeem, that is to purchase your sin, and he will wash you as white as snow. Jesus entered the river of death and came out on the other side. That's the resurrection, folks. Jesus is alive and well today. He died for you, but he rose again on the third day. And he sits at the right hand of the Father. So for you, God, where are you? I've given you three steps that will get you there to God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you've been so good to us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your provision. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we might remember what it's like to be far away from you because of sin in our lives. But we can come back and have a close relationship with you once again as we confess those sins openly to you. Speak to us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.